Okay, hi everybody. Um, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series. This is a joint project of the POP Conference, IASPM US, and the Journal of Popular Music Culture, um, Music Studies, sorry about that. Um, I'm Francesca Royster, and um, I'm joining our, our co my co-organizers, Carl Wilson, Kimberly Mack, Eric Weisbard, and Gus Stadler. Um, so, um, I wanted to tell you about our whole calendar of events that are happening um, through the fall, which you can happen, you can find on the IASPM website under the Journal of Popular Music Studies tab. And you can also get on the mailing list by contacting Eric. Um, and then you can catch up on all of the videos of our past sessions. So our last session, which was on the 20, uh, July 26th, um, a fateful day for many of us, um, we had a wonderful presentation by Mike Errico on his new book, Music, Lyrics, and Life, along with his respondent, Burke Bilger. And um, our next session is coming up after a little break in, on September 6th, where we will be hearing um, Eric Tao talk about his new book, Extreme Music, Silence to Noise, and Everything in Between. So um, please um, do check in on the 6th for that date. Um, but for today, uh, we are so very excited and, um, to have LJ Mueller and Manu Reyes, who are going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, sexism in popular music. Um, and um, it, it promises to be insightful, funny, um, theoretical, ethical all at once. Um, it's also just an honor to have our presenters who are making the effort um, across time zones to stay up late with us and present. So let me tell you a little bit about, um, about our presenters today. Um, this book is um, actually a translation of um, the, uh, an award-winning book, Sound on Seximus, which was uh, published in 2018 with Marta Press. And that book was uh, awarded the 2019 book prize. Um, so LJ and Manu are gonna talk to us a little bit about um, an analysis. They're gonna offer an analysis of sexism as a structure of inequality in the sound of popular music. Um, along the way, they say we'll face various obstacles like essentialist reproductions, hermeneutical, her that word, hermeneutical, I haven't said that in a long time, injustices and unconvincing pseudo solutions to a problem of utmost concern. So we're gonna have a theoretical, political and analytic conversation that also promises to be joyful. Um, LJ Mueller um, has studied musicology and cultural studies at Humboldt University in Berlin and is working currently on their PhD. Um, as mentioned, their first book, Sound and Seximus, was awarded the 2019 Book Prize of the International Association for the Study of Popular Music in the non-English category. And they presented on issues of gender, feminism, sexism, and popular music in various national and international contexts. Um, they also received the Maria Hanacek Prize for Best Young Researcher presentation at the AS IASPM DACH conference in 2016. Manu Rias, who is also going to be talking about issues of translation, um, is uh, a, a junior lecturer of arts and cultural sociology, mediality to intermediality and popular music. They studied pop popular music and arts, culture and media at the University of Groningen. Their work focuses on topics of sound, gender, queer theory, and critical theory, and they presented their work at international and German conferences. So, um, so excited to turn things over to our presenters, but first, just to let you know that um, if you have questions and comments, please be sure to put them in the chat. Carl Wilson is going to be the moderator of the chat after the presenters are done. Um, presenters, you don't have to worry about following the chat while you're speaking because Carl is on top of it. And um, basically Carl will, Carl will invite people to share their own questions afterwards. So I'm um, so excited again for this 
incredible sounding presentation and a chance to practice my own German pronunciation. And I'm going to turn things over now. Um, and I am muting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I'm really, really excited. Um, what I'm going to do now is um, I will do a presentation and afterwards we, we I thought we have a collective um, um, discussion. And well, I, I will just start, I think, um, with sharing my screen and uh, yeah, present you my, well, what I prepared. And, and it really was a lot of fun to prepare this. And I really hope you have a lot of fun. Uh, you enjoy it too. Um, and I first thought I, I would give rather more personal idea, a personal story of how I, as a student, um, came to write this text and then, then to publish it, which is, um, is this working? Yes, it is working. That's the, the German book, published in 2018 with Matter Press, and um, now this is the English translation, um, just out, just now. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, it was very much fun to, to do this with Manu together, and um, well, um, but I while I was preparing this presentation, um, yeah, it, it turned out to, to become more complex and more theoretical. And it was like, OK, uh, well, this is quite complex and it, it's hard to follow. And I had the, I was like, OK, um, it was getting into a theoretical, I, maybe two to force. So and, and actually, that's not really a surprise because this is a, the a theory book, I would say. I would call it a music theory book, although I, um, we might uh, argue over the, my, my use of the term, but I, I like to call this music theory, but it is theory, like music theory, um, or th thinking theoretically about music. And well, when it turned out to become more complex, I felt that I cannot present it like that. And so I, I had the idea of turning it into something like a jump and run game. Um, as you might have guessed from the, the invitation that I formulated and sent out to you. And I will just start into that, I think, without any further explanation. So let us start with framework stories, which is um, that once upon a time in a beautiful castle that actually is um, Humboldt University about 10 years ago, where I studied, um, where I studied um, musicology and cultural studies, but actually I studied much more um, popular music studies, I would say, and gender studies, because at the time the schedules were quite liberal and I was able to um, follow mainly my interests and this is where my interests, interests lay. And of course, I asked myself how sexism plays its part in popular music. Um, also, this is not just um, some sort of an academic question for me, but it is also motivated by some sort of a feeling of feeling that that something's really not feeling right or right, that something's feeling wrong. Um, and I have this uh, feeling towards a lot of popular music and I really wanted to get an explanation for this feeling. And well, I, I of course did at that time what uh, students most of the time would do when they have a question. I went to the library and I searched for literature. And I found a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of great, I, I'm, I assume it's this, this is in the center, isn't it? I'm sorry for, for just this interruption. Well, I found a lot of great, great literature on gender issues in popular music. I found literature on music industry. Is this working? No, it's not. Sorry about that. There it is. I found lots of literature on music industry and gender, for example, and sexism and lyrics and gender performances and music videos, working conditions and so on, and so on, and so on, very, very much literature. And all this um, really shows that there's, um, when it comes to popular music, there's sexism like all over the place. It's like everywhere, but there was something I did not uh, find very much about, and that's like, um, well, what about sound? What about music of this sort of magical force that actually is touching off the skin? And of course, I went on to such for literature, and I found mainly semiotics, which actually um, at the moment seems to be the tool for music analysis in relation to gender and current popular music studies. Semiotic models now very often are presented in tables like this one. And semiotics are really great because they allow us to attach content to music to say based on sound and not on context or on lyrics what a song is about. But um, when one is familiar with gender theories, 
it is quite obvious that something is missing from this picture. Actually, quite a lot is missing. Um, first, this visual metaphor, as I see it, actually suggests equivalence, placing femininity and masculinity on sort of the same layer. And this gives us the impression as if this was um, some sort of uh, equivalence, but actually um, sexism in, in the real world, in fact, produces a hierarchy. And second, this table also suggests that um, some sort of a mutual exclusive dualism or in sort of an opposition. That is um, that we get an idea of uh, like a plus and a minus pole of uh, masculinity and femininity and attributes of music tend to be organized in opposition, which is um, not only a potential source for mistakes because it um, doesn't necessarily follow that if um, masculinity, for example, is coded as uh, loud, then femininity um, must be soft. Um, that's not a necessity. But further, um, the idea of two poles organizes music on a one dimensional scale, which makes it hard to imagine something like a multipolar, like um, a third or fourth or fifth um, pole of uh, maybe um, musical attributes um, uh, for, for music. Well, and then there's my next uh, problem that is what I call it's always two steps to the music with semiotics. That, um, for example, if uh, femininity, or if in a music example, it's just softness, then the softness um, often is seen as suggesting femininity, and therefore the music does not signify directly femininity. But without that, when I wonder about um, sexism, how can I even hope to find sexism in the music? It's like um, there's a step in between, and I cannot really cross that with semiotics alone. And also this model I see is quite ill-equipped um, to, to deal with intersectional discrimination and often implies a privileged performance of gender as white, able-bodied, heterosexual, and so on. But even worse, if we um, uh, try to include in the um, idea of uh, semiotics, um, sem um, includes intersectionality, it just repeats actually the above problem of false equivalence, which just adds further types of femininity and masculinity all on the same layer not only hiding sexist inequalities, but even further hiding racist, ableist, heterosexist, classist inequality, and moreover, um, hiding the complex dynamics that are produced by intersectional discrimination. So um, this not really um, gives us a, a good metaphor of uh, how reality really works. And finally, um, I see such, uh, such tables um, suggesting a simplified model of uh, subversion, which just um, switches the attributes. But just changing attributes doesn't necessarily change anything about inequality. Thus, this model may even bring us to a reductive conclusion that, for example, if a man just performs some softness or some other attributes seen as feminine or queer, that therefore fundamental, um, something fundamental would have changed. But that is not necessarily true, especially not when it is again or still a white male who is seen as expressing the younger generation. And also there are many further problems that could be named, especially the semiotics in themselves are a highly debated field with many, many open questions. And there's a huge debate um, as well that even argues that semiotics are not neutral in themselves um, in relation to gender and sexism, but are bound up with gender dynamics already. And we will come back to that later. So right now, I believe we can conclude that um, actually uh, semiotics does not allow for, um, for uh, a real um, analysis of sexism as a structure of inequality in music, although it might be quite um, productive and giving um, insights on gendered attributes. And therefore, um, I believe it's quite important to first of all um, reject such a table as not helpful for an understanding of sexism, as in short, sexism is not a semiotic structure, not alone. And this simply I see as not helpful as a visual metaphor for understanding that. But what do I mean by um, sexism as a structure of inequality? What do I mean by that? In my understanding, which I take much more from cultural and gender studies, um, sexism as a structure of inequality places men as a norm and women as others in relation to their gender. Further, men and women are placed in a normative relation in which men are supposed to desire women, and thus sexism is also intertwined strongly with heteronormativity and with cis normativity, excluding all people which do not fit this fit into this normative frame as strange or as not normal or as not intelligible, as Judith Butler has argued. Further, femininity and the logic of sexism has to fulfill several functions for masculinity, like being an object of desire, caretaking, emotional support, projection screen for devaluations, and, and many more. And therefore, femininity under the logic of sexism is oriented towards masculinity and has to experience itself as other too, while masculinity, which can experience itself as unstatulness, is oriented towards the world. 
And this logic of sexism further is inscribed in gender subjectivities and bodies through repetitive cultural, social, academic, and institutional actions that implicitly reproduce these norms. And because of that, sexism is a lived experience, experience for all genders. And further, gender thus, as I understand it, is a way of being in the world that is already pre-structured by inequality and cannot be reduced to just attributes. It explains itself that this is not a natural order, but has to be constantly reproduced to keep in place. And hopefully this is and will be changing fundamentally so that we can one day um, live in a more equal world. Um, and of course, my, my question from the beginning is really about that. What about this structure and sound? Now, analysis methods for the reproduction of inequality in other medias or other art forms are actually quite established, like in literature and film and visual arts. But there's really a huge lack of such methods in relation to music. And before I go on trying to really fill this gap, I believe it is good to reflect shortly about the reasons for this lack. Let's go down. I call this place the hermeneutical injustice dungeon. I only learned the term hermeneutical injustice, which was coined by Miranda Fricker much later after, after I, already stood before those walls and flames several times. And for me, that named it quite well. It means that there's not only inequality or injustice, but also a lack of words or a lack of means to name and to talk about these injustices. Therefore, I understand this lack of tools to analyze inequality in popular music, not just as some random desideratum, but as part of the inequalities that minorities face in musicology and music theory in general. And therefore, I believe it is necessary to think about what hurdles there might be for the development of music analysis of inequality in our discipline. And I like to name a few. Well, first of all, there's what I call false dualisms um, that produce at the same time oppositions and analogies. Those are, for example, music versus language or the auditive versus the visual. And those dualisms often idealize music as something inherently good or subversive, as something that would withstand the control of language or the control of vision, which is often in such dualisms bound up with white Western masculinity. So often music seems to become a subversive superforce that fights injustices just because it's music. And well, I, I just, I absolutely do not buy that because when we fall into that trap, we can hardly formulate a valid criticism of music as possibly reproducing problematic injustices in itself. Music, to my understanding, might do good or bad thing, just as words might be harmful or helpful, and as poetry or painting um, may be producing ideological contents, we cannot exempt music from that beforehand. Second, there is a false restriction, as I see it, to a limited understanding of what counts as music. It's often reduced in much discourse mainly to harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic parameters, um, which I know is changing, but still this is um, some sort of a center where we start to think about it. And this leads also to some sort of an a priori disembodiment of musical sound, which becomes some sort of pure sound, as if the sound sources and the activity of sound production would not be part of what we hear and what therefore is part of the music. Further, this produces an unclear object position of music or sound, where it is widely acknowledged that listeners engage with music. There are no detailed models of the form of this engagement, and especially there are no models about differences between differing sorts of engagement. And now such separation of different modes of engagement actually are very relevant in the analysis of sexism in other media, but it is not an available tool for music analysis yet. And then, related to this problem, um, there is the ongoing exclusion of popular music from music theory development. Of course, in popular music, as primarily recorded music, sounds, and particularly voices, play a different role, also in terms of engagement. But this is not yet reflected upon in music theory as a theory of how engagement with music works. And this is not just um, a question, I believe, of just including popular music into music theory, but actually really a question of changing fundamental assumptions of what music theory is or what it does or what it should be doing. And of course, there is um, the probably biggest obstacle for an analysis of inequality in music that is what I would say the ongoing exclusion um, of marginalized people and much music theory development because the questions that are asked and the questions that are answered depend on those who are doing this work. And so my first conclusion was that um, most music theory and many assumptions about music that I had learned are not only not helpful for answering my question, but even actively block the way there. 
I realized that the questions of traditional music theory were not my question, and therefore the tools of music theory were not going to work for me. Although I still want to claim that what I'm doing really still is music theory. And so, um, well, so I needed new tools for a new way of analyzing popular music, and well, I needed some sort of a feminist toolbox for music analysis. So instead of facing those obstacles head on and getting burned up in the discourse of um, that from my angle just seems to be made to protect music from criticism, we for now will just leave this place. I'm not, of course, the first person searching for such feminist tools for music analysis. I'm particularly grateful to the work of Barbara Bradby, who has developed um, feminist lyrics analysis based on Christopher's genotext already in the 1980s. Um, also, Susan McClary um, has done, of course, many, many great things, but I found particularly her reflection on desire and narrators and harmonic structures very fruitful. And also Susan Kusick has written a great text on gendered performativity in music, which focuses on how a curable inner body is performed in voices. Then um, I'm quite inspired by Anna Hit Kasabian, who has analyzed film music and argues that music takes part in structuring engagement in film in relation to gender, and of course, um, Nina Altsheim has um, famously reflected on how we listen to voices and how that is influenced by um, racialized stereotypes and actually shapes, really shapes what we hear. And all those authors found new and innovative ways of dealing with music and sound. And um, I really enjoyed reading all of them, but still, um, it did not feel like really finding an answer, but maybe much more like, like finding some, some, some bits and pieces, some, some building blocks for a huge puzzle and some directions of where to go on. And so to put this puzzle together, I felt I needed some sort of theories and I looked for inspiration into feminist literatures um, and other disciplines. And I especially went back to two very found foundational texts. Those are Laura Mallory's Visual Pleasures and Narrative Cinema. Most important, as you probably know, um, for the idea of the male gaze in visual arts. And also I read Julia Kristeva's um, Revolution in Poetic Language, which is a very interesting critique of gender and semiotic thinking, focusing especially on the materiality of language, which she calls genotext, and how this is tied to a culturally learned effectivity and embodiment, which she calls Kora. Reading such texts led me to questions like the following. Um, which tried to translate some of the work um, of Mulder and Kristeva to music, and which I then had in mind when I listened to music. Those are, for example, can, can, can ears gaze? And if yes, how can this gazing be analyzed? Does certain music, for example, invite gazing? Does some music invite it more than other music? Do we actually hear subjects when we listen to music? And if yes, in what way? What can we say about those subjects? Are they equals or do they serve a function in relation to ourselves? Are they gendered? Um, also, can sound address a you? If yes, can this you be gendered? Is there a gendered addressy of music? Who is addressed? Ad who is addressed by music? And um, then there's um, for me the question of how do we relate to music, which is similar to how do I experience myself in listening? How do I come into being as a probably most of the time gendered subject when I listen to music? And finding questions, I believe, is a great step forward to finding answers, but it is not so straightforward actually to really um, answer this question in relation to music. What we need, therefore, are some theoretical conceptions to separate different forms of engagement with sound or different modes of relation to music. And to find such concepts, I looked into my sources like Malvey and Kristeva and how they found such a tool for their work. And um, what well, they particularly work with terms like identification and desire and, and well, uh, fetishism and castration and the like, which they take from psychoanalysis, as you, as you probably know. And psychoanalysis is famously criticized for producing essentialist images of gender and race, and therefore transporting a lot of sexist and racist baggage. And well, those psychoanalytic um, sexist and racist assumptions are unfortunately often naturalized, um, especially when psychoanalysis is applied for cultural analysis which often reproduces its theories unquestioned facts 
Um, for example, when the electric guitar, it is often called Faldek, as you probably know, um, often without any explanation why or, or what Faldek means. And then it is often understood as intrinsically male, again, without further explanation. And this, of course, naturalizes the Faldek as male and does not see it as a cultural concept, which is reproduced as male again and again. And this is not only a misapplication, but really a problem that comes with psychoanalytic theory um, and that has to be dealt with. But uh, fortunately, I would argue, it is um, possible to already um, sidestep this problem um, with the help of Judith Padler's um, theory, because um, she has developed uh, an understanding of psychoanalytic images of gender and related psychic dynamics as performative, that is, as not pre-given and natural, but as reproduced and naturalized through cultural activity. On this basis, I argue that it is possible to gain an understanding um, of identification and other relevant psychoanalytic concepts, which are used in Malvey's male gay theory that is not essentialist, but is based on cultural reproduction and applicable to popular music. And so I come to the end, uh, to a separation of listening experiences of differing auditive pleasures, which can be understood as different dynamics or different modes of or that organized listening experience and effects of level. And of course, this term auditive pleasures is inspired um, very much by Malvey's visual pleasures, and um, the separation of different um, auditive pleasures that is different modes of, of listening. Um, this is one of my, um, I call it feminist tools for music analysis that I developed in my first chapter. And, and I like to, to um, introduce some more tools. Another one is um, what I call the vocalic body. I take this term from Stephen Connor, who argues in his book, Dumbstruck, that every voice always carries or entails a body. And this body is not a real body producing the sound, uh, not the real body that is producing the sound, but a projection or an image that is made up all the time when we listen to a voice. Like um, then on a phone call, one gets an image, uh, an impression um, of, this, of the person we're talking to, but um, we only know this, uh, this person from the telephone call, so it's just an, an imagination. And this, of course, can also be related to performativity theory and to physics explication of performativity to voice analysis. Therefore, I argue that from hearing a voice, one gets an impression of a body as a supposed source of that voice. And this body can be named and described and analyzed in many, many ways. And, and the third tool that I like to introduce is, um, I call it the sonical body, um, which names a culturally learned and sedimented music related embodiment in the process of listening. And this body or embodiment is shaped culturally. It is based on past music experiences, but also on gendered experiences. And this concept might be similar to what has been discussed lately in listening theories that listening is not a neutral activity, but it's actually culturally learned and more often than not projects problematic images. But I, I argue further that this takes part in how the listening subject experiences itself in relation to music, and that this experience is not limited to listening, but has to be understood more wholesome as well as an, an, an embodiment, which is involving the whole um, way of how we experience our own body in relation to music, and then also um, through this um, as an experience, as an ex embodied experience, experience that um, the music offers to us. And I have to give credit, credit for this concept to Julia Kristeva's idea of the Chora, but also um, I relate this to Donna Haraway Cyborg and to, um, well, Kia Denora's idea of music as true thesis that she argues for. So um, those are three very important tools for me to understand music. But also I want to mention that in my first chapter, I also take stop of all, stock of already established tools like homologies, semiotics, um, which despite all the criticism that I, I, I have, still I find it as a very helpful um, tool um, in combination with other tools. And also I suggest genotext analysis of um, lyrics um, as something that should be considered music analyzed as well, because it really does matter whether in lyrics there are more O vowels or more E vowels, for example. And now with all my tools, I, I did some music analysis of some songs, which leads me um, to my findings. In my second chapter, I analyzed the voice of two male singers, two white male singers, Robbie Williams and Kurt Cobain in two songs. And I argue that both their voices follow the same aesthetic paradigm, which I call the real voice. Now that real voice 
is not more real than any other voice, but it produces some sort of realness or genuineness that suggests that we can experience some sort of inner truth about the feelings of the singer. I understand the real voice as a norm normative aesthetic model. And with that, I mean the implicit logic, how listeners will make sense of a sound or a voice within a musical structure. This model works through identification which is a related order to pleasure in which the singer, the listener, and the voice basically come into some sort of congruence. Um, this congruence or this note of identifiable listening I see as motivated on a sonical level by inner body sounds, for example, roughness and tension of the diaphragm, by hearable, effect, uh, hearable activity and effort, and by a first person spatial position of the voice like very central and very close. And especially the effort or strain that is audible as embodied activity of the singer makes the voice not so much into some musical object of contemplation, but into some um, trace of a subjective activity. So the voice becomes tied to the subject, which is actively doing something when it's singing. And of course, this model strongly co is coded as male and white. Historically, it's closely tied to the male rock voice, but it can be heard also in boy groups, such as the Backstreet Boys or in Robbie Williams, as I show. And what changes there is not the basic model of perception, but the emotional content. Or the vocalic body might present different effective emotional contents, but all in a way that offers itself to identification. On the other hand, in my third chapter, I analyze four examples of white female singers that are, that are Kate Bush, Carly Minogue, Pjörg and Birdie. And to understand these four examples on the level of aesthetic and effective engagement or auditive pleasures, I find much more um, heterogeneity. Still, it does not make much sense, as I argue, to understand any of these voices according to the real voice norm and use them just for identification. And I believe that this heterogeneity um, this, that is produced on the side um, really is um, produced also by, by very much creativity, which um, becomes um, I believe very much invisible and hard to understand um, as long as everything is mainly judged um, in relation to the normative model of the, of the white male real voice. Um, and I first like to just name and celebrate this, this diversity on the side. And I want um, with my analyze to make this creativity visible. Still, there are some recurring effects that I see as quite damaging. All these different models. Um, First of all, there's very often something that I call an object voice. That is a voice that is audibly subjected to especially aesthetic forming. That is, it is manipulated either by the singer or by sound production. And this may have several effects like making the voice an object of auditive contemplation, for example, is just a beautiful sound instead of a trace of the subject, as I argued on the other side. But it may also work as a bait for desire. Um, especially in the normative context of a real voice, this voice produces a distance that hides the subject and thus produces a desire for disclosure. Through this, I come to a more complex understanding of desired channeling in music, which can take place on many planes. It can be found basically everywhere where there is a striking absence in the sound. And in the examples of Kylie Minogue and Kate Bush, I analyze two very different ways of how desire is produced and channeled and what exactly is desired. Further, I found um, very often something that I would like to call fragmentation of the vocalic body. For example, there can be sonic particularities like vocal fry or some supposed mistake in singing, which of course is there always intentionally. Such embellishments will distract us and work as some candy or bait for attention that just um, focuses on the surface level. Also, female voices smile quite often, which places an emphasis on the body surface as well and not on the inside. And also fragmentation can take place, of course, through production, for example, through the use of repetitions, multilayering, and ongoing changes in the way how the voice is produced. At times, through such techniques, it might even be hardly possible to get an impression of, of any body at all. As if the voice was coming from a free-floating ghost-like entity um, getting some sort of spherical um, disembodiment. Um, while on the other hand side, when the body becomes more material, it's often presented as a place um, or a source um, for pain. Or the body seems to be there as an ability to control oneself. And Kaya Silverman, for example, has argued that in film, there's a special pleasure related to screaming women. And so some singing styles I 
I see seem to share a similar logic when they perform a body as uncontrolled and vulnerable. And um, as, you, as you see it right now, um, if you look at this picture, vocal performances in popular music seem to be very much bound up with um, a very sexist logic, I'd say. But that's not the only point I, I'd like to do to make here. The structure um, presents differences in how the vocalic body relates to its own vocalic, um, or how the vocalic subject relates to its own vocalic body. That's the idea of a subject that we hear and the body that it has. And that uh, the inner organization and relation between the subject, the, its voice and its body um, is different. While on one side, the structure shows, shows a simple identity of subject and voice as some sort of embodied wholeness. The other side is much more complex, but first of all, it's based on an on a non-identity or, um, or a split. Um, that is, the voice is separated from the body and from the subject. And if there even is, um, well, is, is a chance that this might influence real world gendered embodiment and work as a model for real world men and women, then, well, I, I believe in this um, really shows quite an extreme, quite, quite a harmful structure. And I honestly, actually, I believe that it's quite, plausible that this has some real world impact. And um, while well, writing this text, um, actually, one of the hardest things for me um, was to face this, this, this theme and, and to really swallow this because um, this then impacts not just a superficial structure um, of who's getting what resources or how um, sexes and places us and in different relations and, and gives um, gives different chances to people, but, but really um, it's a way of how, um, uh, it's, a, it's a structure of how we, we all relate to our own bodies that, that shows itself in this structure. And um, well, that's, uh, well, I, I believe that popular music tells us some of those um, ideas um, and gives us ideas of, of how um, there's a gendered embodiment. Well. And, and I do not want to relativize that because um, according to my finding, findings, the aesthetic paradigms of popular music um, do follow, well, a very harmful scheme. And I really want to dismantle this here, but, but also this picture runs the risk of reproducing women just as, as passive victims or as even partaking in their own submission. And this is why I found it very important to give positive or an empowerment read empowering reading of each music example um, of a female singer in my book. Thus, each song from a female perspective, I argue, which is never a neutral perspective, but um, a perspective of already embodied um, perspective, already shaped by sex experiences in many, many ways. Um, I argue that um, each song still may make sense and may be helpful um, in real world situations. Um, and, and not it's just, well, it's, it's not just a way of um, being um, subjected to sexism, but it's also always a way of dealing with sexism in one way. Um, so, so overall, I believe that this complex plane of different aesthetic models that I see on this side that originates actually, I say, in the many possible dynamics that um, can, can evolve when we have um, a split between voices, singing and listening subjects, that, in, um, that this field also allows for many, many interventions that can also serve as a resource for ways of empowerment within the structure of ongoing sexism. And I also believe it's a resource for creativity and activity and shaping real world life traditions and making sense of those for many women. And I also want to um, well, give a positive idea of that and, and celebrate it actually. Yeah, and with that, well, we are, we are almost at the end. And now my, my caterpillar has crawled quite a dif dif distance, but um, it will now not become a beautiful butterfly and reach some final stage and give in to the promise of, of supposed fulfillment and completeness. I actually took the caterpillar as an image because I believe it's a good metaphor for being partial and being incomplete. And that is why I want to end this presentation with positioning this book as also partial and incomplete in itself. Well, there are many ways of how to go on with what I presented so far. There's one topic that I want to raise particularly. And as you have probably um, realized, all my music examples um, are about white men and white women. And this is not unconscious neglection, but a conscious restriction based for me on my aim and on my method. 
My main aim is to criticize the reproduction of sexism in popular music. And with this aim in mind, it did not feel right to, as a white person, choose a song of a person of color and then dismantle how it is reproducing sexism. Especially not um, when the accusation of being sexist is already widely used in a racist manner. Second, my method is strongly related to my own embodied experiences of music consumption, which I then, then dismantle. And I assume that in the consum consumption of popular music is racialized, racialized aesthetic theme can be dismantled as well. Um, it will most probably allow white listeners to experience orders of pleasures related to their, their, their own race. And that is, it will allow white people, which contains me, to experience, naturalize, and enjoy white privileges and the consumption of popular music and thereby become white. Um, and finding tools that allow from a white perspective to re reflect on that, I believe is really a, a really huge task on its own. And I cannot really hope to find it as a side effect of my reflection on sexism. But well, my caterpillar believes that there is no need to solve everything at once, oneself, just all alone. And so the dungeon of hermeneutical injustices and popular music, I believe, is still full of flames. There's probably even more obstacles than I, what I see now. And the fight against the, let's call it the boss monster of intersectional discrimination lies still ahead. But I believe that this will be a collective battle, battle. So my intention with translating this book is to share what I have found so far so that it's available to whoever finds it useful. Because it's tools and those tools are for, well, for, for application and maybe also for, for changes, open for further changes in the future. And with that, I'm at the, uh, the end of my presentation. I have to give some acknowledgments for some pictures that I used. Well. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, now I would stop screen sharing and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Observation? Or anyone else? Um. LJ, were you and Manu um, planning to have a conversation? I thought that was yeah. part, part of the. Ah, no, I thought we we got we now go to a discussion, a collective discussion, and we both take part in the discussion now, Manu and me. And um, we thought we now discuss maybe issues of how translation works and all that. So I thought I'd do the pre presentation. Uh, I might not have been completely clear about that in, in the steps of when we prepared this presentation because um, we came up with an idea and then we changed it again. So um, <laughs> I'm sorry for the misunderstanding. Well, LJ, we may maybe, um, maybe you and Manu could get started um, because we don't have that many questions from the audience yet because they've been sort of no, I thought there was some, paying, attention to, paying attention to the, no, those are mostly just comments and not questions. So maybe if you okay. start with, if you start with a couple of points that'll give time for people to formulate questions. Okay, okay. Um, well, then, Manu, what should we talk about? Maybe sure. um, you can tell something about, um, we can tell something about translation. Or the first yeah, translation. I mean, I would probably start with just my experience writing the um, translating this book, um, because of course, I had read the book um, before translating it in a, I don't want to say not careful manner. Uh, but rather in, in the manner that you just read books as a kind of, you know, exchange of thoughts and you just see the argument and you think, okay, this is nice, this is great. But then when you get to translate it, you are thinking with, and that's a different type of engagement that I found also uh, at times a little bit challenging because for me, um, the field of popular music studies is, I noticed that rather quickly, quite different from what it was to you. And I think it is because um, there are different traditions that are very clearly marked by different scholars uh, and where those scholars come from. Um, for me, um, so my um, supervisor for my thesis um, was um, Professor Kristen McGee, who's an ethnomusicologist. Um, and she is very much of the line of Simon Frith. And so the kind of sociological, uh, non-musical analysis of 
things. I'm not sure if non-musical is correct here because her approach is quite performance-based. Um, never felt suspect, so to say. Um, whereas your background in musicology made that from the outset basically a clear issue, right? And so that that was something that I found quite interesting because I had just started to get really into the idea of sonic materiality. Um, and so working on translating the book was already uh, kind of an eye opener into the German tradition, German world, German kind of debate, perhaps. Uh, and so this is also one of my hopes that it kind of comes across that the book is translating not just the words, but also just the traditions and the backgrounds and the histories of um, different, yeah, very different kind of um, philosophical cultures about music, popular music in particular. Yeah, it's, um, I, I would just uh, jump into that because um, it's, um, it's it's really um, I, I feel like it's um, I'm I do not really know the, the U.S. American and the international context. I'm, I'm from the German context very much, um, and I, I always I, I also feel okay. Um, there are so, or we had so many discussions on, on how which words can be used and, and which words to translate this concept. Um, for example, there's um, especially the sonical is the translation of the German word the sonische, which is a concept by Peter Wicke, um, who's who's an um, important teacher for me. And uh, he has this idea of um, the sonical or this, the sonische is not um, simply being an acoustic, but being um, acoustic that's already sh shaped culturally and that we already um, listen to in a culturally learned way. Um, so the sonical is, is a music, is a, is a sound that is pre structured for music. That's not neutral, but that is um, sort of, uh, um, what is it? Um, that's, um, that's, that's already um, pre-structured as something that we can understand as music. So um, that we are not encountering neutral sounds in music, but sounds that we already learned from past experiences as being part of music um, that we already have learned to relate to in a, in a musical way. And now the question for me was, what is the, such a musical way? Okay, but... Other questions now? Maybe we can have a. a yeah. I'm a bit, I'm, 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 I also have to um, admit I'm a bit um, skipping through the chat and it's a bit distracting me, um, I have to say. Yeah, we, encur we encourage the presenters to ignore the chat. I'll send you a transcript of the, at later so you'll get a chance okay, to look at everything good. that was said. I, I really like to have a transcript of it later. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Francesca, I think you were the first to have um, a comment quest slash question. Sure. Yeah, actually, um, I, I just so enjoyed this and it's really thought provoking and clever and just interesting and thinking about music um, in conversation with other theories that have shaped me as well. And I was thinking about uh, Tina Camp's uh, work on um, listening to images mm -hmm. and especially the way that she's thinking about the gaze as it's also as it's kind of allied with with whiteness in terms of vibration, but mm -hmm. um, also not just thinking about the gaze, but also thinking about the subjects of photographs like governmental photographs, mm -hmm. like passport photos that are used for immigration. Um, she looks especially at um, black images in her work, but really kind of thinking about the ways that images produce or suggest sound and produce feeling and vibration that might be connected to sound um, like for the person who's looking, but also kind of the suggestion of sound um, kind of of the subjects of the, of the photographs themselves. So it's about how, um, how an image suggests some sort of, so of, of sound that sounds really interesting. I, I did not know. What was the name of the author? Camp? Yeah, it's Camp. Um, I was thinking Camp, but I had that wrong. It's C-A-M-P-T, Tina Camp. Um, and she's, yeah, kind of thinking intersectionally about mm -hmm. um, visuality as well as sound. And sound is a way 
for her, I think a way of giving life and agency to the ways that images have kind of um, objectified or deadened the ways that mm -hmm. images of people of color have circulated. So it's almost like sound and vibration present life or the, mm -hmm. the um, potential for life. Um, I just mm -hmm. think it might be just an, an interesting read for oh. you in conversation with everything else. So That's not fun. really a question, just to like, a, hey, what do you think? Sounds really interesting. I, I don't know that. So so really, thank you for that um, um, for that literature. Um, I, I will uh, definitely look into that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Francesca. We have Lucretia next. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you so much for this. I, I actually have been, I just wish I could just hug this whole presentation. It's just, I just completely Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. I hear you fully. I hear you. Um, so just two quick comments, because a few other people have some really comments, too, that are like what I wanted to also ask. I was really interested in what you said about the guitar solo. I have oh. often heard, like, is that like phallic or are we creating that phallic? And then like, like, what do you think? Is it phallic or are we creating it phallic? And then the other thing is just about sound and film, you know, for so many years. And I've just really thought about how the sound of a woman having an orgasm is how we um, continue to see women as sexual beings, because usually it's, we hear the woman coming even before we see her naked and it's, the sound is yet another way to objectify and sexualize women and i really think we do that in music so i just wanted to give those two quick comments and thank you again i cannot wait to buy your book and okay 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 um thank you uh lucrece lucrece yeah um I, thank you for that comment okay the guitar solo um i've been thinking about that um it's not part of my book but um uh, actually, I believe, well, it depends on what we understand as phallic and what definition we get of it. Um, and based on um, psychoanalytic theory um, and trying to deconstruct its essential assumptions, I believe we can get um, to an impression of um, relating it to this sort of act, um, activity that I argue for the voice. Um, this, uh, that, I, in, that invites identification. And I believe that this is true also for many, many young guitar solos, but probably not for all of them. So um, I would say there is a, a basis for this uh, claim, but um, it has to be argued quite clearly and um, it has to be said exactly what we mean by that term. This is what I would argue, for example, something like that, um, that there are some, some solos like that. And what was the other question? Oh, the sex sounds. Actually, um, I have an analysis um, in a book chapter that I'm preparing right now, um, but it's German. But um, it's an analysis of this um, Je Tam song and um, about how sex sounds and how, how the um, different voices of, um, uh, of Gainsbourg and um, oh, I'm really bad with names. <sighs> I have used those names so often. Well, how, um, how her, uh, her vocals and, and his vocals are presented in, in different ways and what sort of desire is produced there and how and in what way. So um, yes, sex sounds and, and femininity, I believe, um, uh, produce sexism and objectification, but it's too simple to just say it's um, just working because it's just some sort of breathing or heavy breathing or anything like that, because if we do this, then it's just, um, just naturalizing um the the whole um sexism and all this debate and not um talking about the way how this is all produced and how this is very artificial and how this is really channeling some sort of desire and what is really objectified in all this um all these sounds okay fascinating <laughs> um, that thank question you. I... Thank you. next question <laughs> probably um Parishka, i think is the next step yes Hi, uh, Priska or Catherine. Uh, I, just, I just enjoyed this so much. Um, again, fascinating and delightful. I especially enjoyed the uh, big boss level of hermeneutics that uh, we may not be ready to challenge yet. I wondered if you'd talk a little bit more about how you found Donna Haraway useful. Um, huh. The cyborg has been useful. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's maybe a funny um, combination of saying I combine uh, Christopher and um, Haraway. But actually, this idea of um, Christopher of saying that, the, um, that we uh, learned, well, Christopher is arguing about language and semiotics. And um, for Christopher, we uh, learn our own embodiment in relation to language. So um, language shapes how we feel in our body as well, or our mother tongue does this. Um, in a very fundamental way for, for um, Christopher. And Christopher then goes on to essentialize that, which is criticized, which has been criticized many, many times. But um, actually, I believe we can um, understand this as something like um, a cyborg uh, idea of um, the cyborg metaphor, a cyborg embodiment of um, us uh, being produced in relation to a technique or in relation to um, something, so some cultural um, shaping. For example, this um, I see on this side as a cyborg, um, or this this means that the body, the embodiment, or how we feel our body is um, produced in relation to language um, in the argument of um, Christopher. And I believe this is um, this can be seen then, and um, this can very well be related to to the cyborg metaphor of Haraway. This is how I relate this, and also, well, Theodora's idea with the prosthesis just fits into this perfectly when she says um, we, we use um, music as a prosthesis to, to produce ourselves, that's, that's very cyborg-like. And um, but also this um, Tia Denora also argues very much um, on basis of, um, of uh, babies who, who latch on to sound. And this is very similar to, um, to Christopher on the other hand side. So um, that's the level where I, I relate those um, three authors. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, Liz Prisbaliski. Thanks so much for this talk. And I think this, my question builds on what you were just saying. Um, when you talked about your later chapter examples with female musicians, you mentioned that some of the impacts are felt in how we relate to our own bodies. Uh, so I'd be intrigued to hear you talk more about how you hear pop music giving listeners ideas or feelings or experiences of gendered embodiment and how this could be harmful. So maybe some examples that you want to share from your, your research with okay. us of how you hear this playing out. Okay, the question, um, well, the, the humble part really for me was, was a way of, of thinking about how I learned my own embodiment or questioning that. Um, so it's quite personal on that level. Um, well, I see the main problem, uh, especially in this um, difference between the, the real voice on the one hand side and the um, sort of more disembodied voices um, of the female examples that I analyzed. So um, the, the um, the real voice um, encouraged for some sort of identification um, that if the that's that's if it's only presented with male performers is very much bound up with masculinity on the first and then um, when I uh, imagine myself as a woman in relation to that I also I, I know from my gendered experience that this is not supposed to be my body or not supposed to be my embodiment um, as I do not really identify myself as just a woman, um, I sort of learned some, especially in queer places, actually, I have to mention, um, some of my, my work is um, inspired very much by, by going dancing in, the queer, in some queer, um, queer ballroom, actually. I was taking part when I was um, on the, when I was um, developing much of my thesis. And I felt very much how I got into a different embodiment um, with many of the male singers than with many of the female singers. So I felt my body very differently. And the sort of male embodiment that I learned from doing some sort of a cross-gender identification at that time um, really felt like getting more options of acting out in the world. So um, the um, female embodiment really feels like um, after that, I it's only through this difference that I felt how um, much I get into a distance idea um, to, to the world. Or maybe you, you know um, Marian Young, who has done a phenomenological work on how embodiment and gender works. 
And um, also my, my thesis fits very well with um, her idea of um, how being, I mean, it's called growing like a girl, where she says that the, the girl doesn't really get her body behind the, the ball because she acts differently and she feels her, her body differently. That's what um, Marion Young argues and um, that the body, um, the female body becomes much more into an object for the female subject themselves um, while the, the male embodiment is much more bound up with being in the world. Does it get clear? <laughs> You, you, you look very critical. Um, you're still on the no, big screen for me, but uh, um, that's, that's about, um, and yeah, it's, it's hard to really um, try to, to, to get this, to, to really grasp this because I believe it's quite personal and I cannot really say that it's harmful for everyone because there are so many, I, I see it also as potential. I see it as, as, as different ways of how we can deal with music. But um, I, I overall got the understanding of seeing popular music as something like, um, like a resource for learning different sorts of embodiment. And maybe this resource is just not uh, shared in an equal way and um, open for everyone. That's Do you mind if I share yeah. some of the discussions that we had in translating this? Because um, yeah, okay. <laughs> so obviously when we were at the part where we were discussing um, Laura Mulvey's psychoanalysis kind of framework to utilize for your uh, research project, uh, all the alarm bells went off, right? Um, uh, the idea that we can kind of assume a subject that is uh, general, or not a subject, but the subject, basically, that can be cycle and analytically uh, studied and then made some, some generalizable statements about what is happening to the subject um, was from the, from, from the beginning, not your aim, but rather something that you wanted to emphasize quite a lot was that it is a tool first and foremost for mm -hmm. us to just start developing a language or forging a language basically um, to describe an experience, whether that's your personal experience or it's an experience that more people are sharing or if it's actually a generalizable experience of people being made subjects, um, that's not the point. The point is first of all, to have a way to describe that experience. And then we started to talk about um, the real voice, but also, um, you know, uh, Kylie Minogue's voice um, and the, the mask that, that she kind of wears. I think that's chapter three. Um, and the source of empowerment that can come from it. Um, I think some of the things that I found quite interesting to take from that was that. Um, especially in indeed queer clubs contexts um the the idea of embodying um fierceness in particular uh to some is hurtful in the sense that it kind of can recreate certain gender stereotypes and to some it's an incredibly empowering method of just first of all find out more about themselves i think it uh, it also mm -hmm. has quite a lot to do with uh, well to use the the opposite of the term gender dysphoria it's a type of gender euphoria moment for some trans people to just kind of recognize hey wait a minute this is in in my my horizon of possibilities to kind of mm -hmm. have this particular sense and i saw already some question about um the about hyperpop and i had to think just about how um Sophie, for instance, uh, really allows that way of experiencing the sonic body or sonical body, to be more accurate, that I think your, your work really gives us tools to, to understand and to not understand perhaps, but give it words to describe that experience for. So uh, just to, to wrap this up, basically, the point isn't to... Um, from how I interpreted it, um, it's not to describe the subject in the subject making, but it's to describe that experience first and foremost with the tools available and the tools that you are creating and hopefully uh, elaborate much more on in your PhD thesis. <laughs> well, for the future, I'm working on that. Um, another question otherwise i could um 
just at least uh, mentioned that, for example, the, the emphasis on words or giving words to something. The original um, paper was, was, a small, was my master, or actually magister, it's called in Germany, the magister thesis. And it was really called uh, In Search of Words, because that was um, sort of my aim to, to find ways of naming what I experience in, in music. There's another question or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, just following up on the mention of hyperpop that came up and, and asked that question. Yeah, hi. Um, maybe Manu already answered this question and thanks for bringing it up. I mean, I've noticed, I, I'm a music journalist, I'm not an academic, but uh, I've noticed in recent years and working with a, um, a cohort of very young fans who are really into hyperpop and also who identify um, as non-binary or trans. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like hyperpop changes the rules in some fundamental ways and mm -hmm. uh, having to do with uh, the way the voice is manipulating and manipulated. And I know there's been some good writing on this, um, not, I don't know about academic writing, but like journalistic writing about how pitch shifting and synthetic, you know, vocalisms. And, and I'm particularly intrigued also by artists like Holly Herndon, who's not a hyper pop artist, but who works with AI. And, and how do we even, I mean, Manu suggested that you are providing these tools, but what are the tools we need to think about music that starts at a non, starts, originates in a non-binary space of creation originate and not because the artist who creates it is non-binary although that's very often true in hyper pop but when you're not working with any idea of the natural you know mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. of any of those terms that falsely identify gender mm -hmm. binaries or falsely signal gender bi binaries yeah and right carl's right it definitely goes back you can go back to laurie anderson you can go back to even craft work i would argue in some ways um mm -hmm. but how what I mean, what happens to your framework in that space where you have, where you're original, you know, where neither the creator nor the audience for the music um, is thinking about crossing over those borders because they don't adhere mm -hmm. to those borders. Thanks. Mm. Well, the question is, um... Does there really exist a place um, outside of, of, sexist, of a sexist framework in the, in the current world? Um, I do not know that. I believe there are many, many places where people fight for, for alternatives. And I believe there are many places where people um, produce alternatives for themselves and um, pleasures that follow other rules. And um, actually, the, the more I think about my framework, I, I get the impression that it gives me also valuable tools to, to think about differences and about um, things that are really new and um, really name what is different and not just say, um, well, okay, uh, this is sort of, but well, we have some feeling that something has changed, but how can we explain this change if we do not already have a, an explanation of how, um, how the normative frame works? So um, my aim was to, first of all, uh, get an idea of how the norm normative frame is working on that on that plane, and then um, from that, I believe it's um, it's uh, we we can name much more exactly what really is happening there and why this is really um where this subversive force, for example, is really coming from. But then mm -hmm. um, also, I believe much subversion is still um in, in many instances still still based at least implicit, implicitly um, by on, on a change on this level on a change of the rules. Um, I'm, I'm not so much familiar with, um, uh, with that theme right now, but um, thinking about it, it's, um, what did I want to say? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, it's uh, past midnight right now. And <laughs> I, um, I was very, I'm still very excited and now I lost my, I lost, I lost, uh, I lost um, <laughs> what is it called? Um, I'm speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> Captain oh, Farn like. Verloren, what's the name and what's that in English? Um, <laughs> I, I lost track of my... I lost track, thoughts. that's what I wanted to say. I'm, I'm very anxious. Um, where was I? Um, I was thinking about I suppose maybe I trans, wanted to say that um, 
that I believe that um, the power of the difference might be um, based very much on the normative frame that might be still in place at some other places. Mm -hmm. Because when we grow up with normativity, and still we know that's not what we want to live by, um, we still are confronted with that. For mm -hmm. example, um, we are confronted with that um, when we uh, go to the supermarket or um, go to, to, to a cafe or any other place. Um, there's a lot of um, very normative music. And um, so I also believe that a lot of potential comes from disruption of that frame. Thank a you. A lot of power comes from that. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have Maya uh, left among the question askers. Hi, yes, thank you for that fantastic presentation. Um, I was Hi. really struck. Okay. <laughs> I was really struck by what you know, you talking about near the end, talking about your positionality um, mm -hmm. and your hesitancy to analyze black singers and performances and how this is missing from, mm -hmm. from this book. And so if someone were to do the type of work that you've done, um, what songs by black artists would you want to see analyzed and why? Whoa, whoa. Uh. Or, or any other non-white artist. Because yeah. the, the, the problem is, um, for me really, is, I mean, um, first of all, the question is, would be um, what, what to focus on first. Um, I believe that also there, first of all, has to be a framework for, for analyzing racism. Um, and this has to be developed. And, and that place, it would be necessary probably to, to work out differences between whiteness and um, how especially blackness is produced in popular music. And I believe um, actually that's uh, really huge, huge, huge issue in popular music because it's, it's so present all the time. But um, as, um, a lot of work is, um, I, I believe there's still a lot of theory that, that should be done on that, on that level. Um, especially if I'm talking about effectivity and um, what I said about how, how we are learning how to position ourselves in relation to music and what embodiment we, we are, well, well, what sort of songs? I don't, I'm thinking right now of doing some analysis of some, some white artists that I see um, appropriating some sort of images of blackness. I'm thinking about doing that and uh, trying to analyze that and trying to find out what function that serves within the song and how this is enhancing, for example, the position of the, the white singer and how it is um, actually working to serve the whiteness of the singer. Um, this is what I'm, I'm thinking about. And there's a, a, actually, I'm most interested on this issue for also um, with, with some German singer who was really, really popular in Germany some time ago, um, that's Peter Fox, who's, um, who I think is, is very interesting, but you probably don't know him. Um, and no, I think I'm not the right person to answer this question because it's also, um, it's a very, um, I mean, I am from a German position uh, also. And um, I also believe that discourse about uh, racism is quite different. And um, I have to, for, 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 and I, if I'm arguing, I'm arguing for, for some sort of something I would call some sort of an embodied um, method of an embodied um, approach to music. And if I, I, I try to do this, um, I suppose I first of all should stick to my, my own national context on that. So um, I think I cannot really give you some, some examples. I think there's so much, there's so much that we could analyze. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your question. Maybe to add to how you came to uh, the examples that you do <laughs> analyze in your book, uh, they were not meant. Hmm? Sorry, is that me? I'm burning something. Oh, okay. Uh -oh. I hope everything's okay. <laughs> um, the cases that you did choose for 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 this book uh, were not. You didn't choose them to, because they were particularly said to be sexist, right? Yeah. You just wanted something kind of base level, something that would yeah. be. I didn't want to say that any of the artists that I analyze are, are particularly problematic. It's just I want to say this is um if we look at popular music, it's like all over the place. 
it's not like that there's nirvana or Kurt Cobain is anything more a problem than, than many, many others. Um, I could probably have chosen many, many other examples. It's just that Kurt Cobain is, is named again and again as the normative singer and singing example. So I thought um, it's the first, pe first person to think about and um, uh, Robbie Williams just um, fits the bell very well if, uh, if someone is really, really popular, especially when um, in, in my, my own um, younger time, I felt that he was um, the most present type of what uh, probably John Shepard calls the, the um, boy next door, uh, Sam Frith and um, Nick Robbie also call the boy next door as the, um, the uh, against the supplement of um, the, the cock rocker. More questions? Well, thank you. I think that's I think that's all the questions we have. Um, and we're getting we're getting around to the point in the hour where we should stop and thank you for um, sticking with us through this to a very late hour where you are. I know it can be a bit of a strain. Um, yeah. And yeah, so thanks very much to LJ and Manu and to all of you for your questions and participation. Um, and it remains only to say that we're um, off for the rest of the month and returning in September uh, with Michael Tao, and we'll have that whole calendar out to everyone soon. Um, so thank you again. I'm going to stop the recording here. <laughs>